Hey, welcome to the channel. I'm Tyson James, president of Sound Faith Consulting, here with another very interesting interview. This time we are talking about Christianity and poker. Before I bring on my guests today, I just want to invite you to support us by subscribing to the channel and turning on the notifications. Uh, if you would like to bless us, you can also go to our Patreon page where you can see all of the details about the amazing projects we have coming up that you can be involved in. So without further ado, what's the deal with Christianity and poker? I'm here today joined by my friend, David Rhodes. David, welcome. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Tyson. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your time. So a little bit about David. David is a court stenographer, a father, a Molinist, which we'll talk about, and a poker player. And when I say poker player, I don't just mean he's getting together with a group of his buddies uh, every once in a while and they're just having fun. I mean, he plays cash games and earns money as part of his income through poker. So this is a very controversial topic. We're going to be tackling a lot of points, both pro and con, and I hope it's interesting and informative. So David, um, this is... Uh, so cool to have you on because we've known each other for a while. Did, did we, I think we first met in the Molinism group. Is that right? It's got to, it's probably been over 10 years. I honestly yeah. think it was probably maybe even like 2013 or so. I, I think it's been yeah. a very, very long time. And I met you yeah. in person one time, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like I know a you a lot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and before I forget, I have to ask you the opening question. What is your earliest memory? My earliest memory of my entire life? Yeah, man, just as far back as you can go. What's your earliest memory? I think uh, maybe a trip to Disneyland that I took when I was about three years old. I kind of have a little, you know, just little like flashes of memories of that. I think yeah, so, that's, yeah. That's pretty early, yeah. A lot of people can't remember anything before they were five or six, so three is pretty early. All right. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so you're a Christian who plays poker. Um, yeah. Just out of curiosity, what is your religious background? Were you raised in a Christian home, a secular home? Did it kind of evolve? How did that happen? I was definitely raised a, a believer, but like everybody in the world, you know, every every Christian, there's been times where I've had, you know, I wouldn't say lapses in my faith. I've always been a believer, but, you know, Satan is a very tempting uh, being. He likes to pull you into his world, and I've definitely been pulled in at times, but I've always held that faith. And uh, yeah, I mean, definitely now, uh, especially in my life, I'm not a perfect person, but I am very much dedicated to Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, none of us are perfect, so uh, we're in the same boat there. Yeah. Um, now, you play poker for cash, so mm -hmm. you make a significant in, uh, amount of income from that. Prior to you starting cash games, when did you first get introduced to poker? When did you first start playing? Well, I, I played a little bit when I was like in high school at friends' houses. We'd play for nickels and stuff. And I was never good. I just had a like a big interest in it. I remember watching this movie, The Sting. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a terrific movie. And there's a great poker scene in it. And I always kind of always enthralled with that. And uh, I you know, got out of high school, I'd always kind of thought about it. And then probably around 2017 or so, I said, I want to actually go start to play. And I actually just got killed. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. And if you don't know what you're doing in poker, you're going to get killed. And But something kept drawing me back to the game, despite the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. And every time I would lose, I would come home and I would wonder, why am I losing? There's got to be something that I am doing wrong. And it is not just a matter of luck because I've noticed that there are certain players that actually seem to know what they're doing. What is it that they're actually doing? So slowly I started to study and I was still kind of losing here and there and I was only playing very sporadically. But uh, it was kind of bizarre because around 2021 i decided to play i didn't want to waste any more money so i thought to myself i'm just going to play a tournament and tournaments aren't very expensive they're like usually like 40 60 dollars to play and hey i'll be able to get to 
I'll be able to play. I probably won't win anything. But I actually did pretty well in that. And that $60 turned into $500 and because I uh, took fourth in that tournament. I got a little lucky. In tournaments, you you need to get a l- pretty pretty lucky to go far in a tournament. It was just a local tournament. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm not going to take any more money out of the bank account. I'm just going to use this money that I have. This is going to be my poker money. And ever since then, I've never had to take money out of the bank account. That was where my seed money came from. And that's the money I've always used for playing poker. And since then, I started to play cash games because it's a little bit difficult to explain why tournaments are a totally different format. And I'm actually not very good at tournaments. It's a different type of uh, strategy. Uh, But I had been studying cash games and I started to play cash games. And I, lo and behold, all of a sudden, I guess I started to become a good poker player because right away I started to win. I imagined that I had a lot of luck at first, uh, but I did kind of know what I was doing. And through that experience and being drawn back to the game over and over again, I just got better and I kept studying. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not like a high stakes uh, guy. You know, there, there are a lot of good poker players who make a side income, uh, but Uh, Something that I definitely like to do, and it's something that when I play, the reason why I consider it to be like a part-time job is only because I expect to make money over time. It's not like I'm just like just kind of throwing money into the wind. I have a strategy, and I do expect over a a certain um, sample size to make money. So uh, that's kind of how it started for me. Very cool. Uh, Did you say how many people were in that first tournament? Do you remember? It was probably 40 people, you know, it was just a local tournament and uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, I it just kind of played for fun and I thought, I don't really want to play tournaments anymore because uh, it's a totally different strategy and, and it, you have to, it relies on a lot of luck to make it worth your while. You need to kind of do bigger buy-in tournaments. $60 buy-ins aren't really worth your time if you're going to do it as a side income. So yeah. Uh, So in, especially in San Diego, it's not really like tournaments aren't really a big thing. You can't just go and do get into big tournaments every day. So, but there are a lot of cash games to play. Yeah. Well, I mean, fourth place in your first tournament, that's uh, out of 40 people. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Very cool. So uh, do you have a favorite professional poker player? Well, I, I think if you were to ask any professional today everybody would say phil ivy is the greatest who has ever lived so i have to say phil ivy uh, but uh, i do like daniel negreanu too i mean he's one of the ogs i really really enjoy watching him play probably my favorite player to watch is this guy named alan keating uh he plays have you ever seen him yeah yeah what's interesting about him is because he gets invited to these live stream games he has to make it it's kind of an unwritten rule. You have to make it interesting. You have to play hands that you wouldn't normally play. And he does wild plays, but at the same time, he has a really good strategy too. He's not just throwing money out there. He actually will use this crazy style, but also use some really sound reasoning as well that I really like to watch. So, yeah. So the live or the live, the, the televised games, they're going to be playing a wider range of hands than they would normally uh, if it wasn't televised, right? Way, way wider. I mean, they play hands that nobody in their right mind would ever play in a, in a regular game, but it would be way too boring to watch live if you watched uh, people playing um, the typical range of hands that you would play in, in a game, at a, in a real game that's not televised. And the type of poker that they're playing for people who aren't familiar is what? Usually Texas Hold'em, or there's a game called Potlum in Omaha that's pretty popular too. Uh, But Texas Hold'em is by far the most popular uh, poker game out there. Yeah. Um, And that's that's what you mainly play as well, correct? Yeah. I I have played a little bit of Potlum in Omaha recently, uh, but... Um, it's something that I haven't really studied very much. There are some similar aspects to it. So I was able to, I'm able to adapt to it, but I still way prefer Texas Hold'em. It's the game that I, that I study the most. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I've, I've played casually, not 
cash games or anything. Uh, I did join a men's church, church men's group for a while. And we would throw in, you know, like $20 um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, have a great time doing that, but nothing, you know, larger cash games or anything like that. But I did used to play a lot of online poker uh, for, you know, play chips and Mm -hmm. just the, the amount of information and learning you do playing the game uh, is it stimulates the brain so much because there are so many different aspects you're trying to keep track of and um, really study people and statistics and your, you know, what, what's your range, you know, how much to bet um, human psychology, all of these different aspects that are just so fascinating. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why when you go to a, a, either a casino or a card room, I would say most of the people that are there are not necessarily chasing a pipe dream or something. It's the competition. You're in a room full of people just like you. You're not playing against the casino, which is another probably a thing we'll get to. You're not playing against the house. You're playing really against other players. And there is an element of luck to it in the short term. But in the long term, it's minds battling. You're really just – your two minds are battling each other, and it's extremely competitive. And that's why it draws in a lot of people who like the competition of it. Okay. Um, next question. What is the most that you've ever won in a single sitting, if you can remember? I think I, I have – so I for, I track all my results. I have an app that I track every one of my hours. Uh I think the biggest, my biggest winning session was like 4,200. But it's important to understand that in uh, the proper way to think about things as a poker player uh, is you don't think of them, you don't think of it as increments of sessions. You think of it as one long session. So Mm. there are times where I, I get killed by even horrible players. You know, I'll get, I'll lose 2,000, 3,000, and then I'll come back and win 2,000, and 3,000, and 1,000. It's all over the map. But uh, yeah, but there was, yeah, there was one day that I did pretty well. I did, I made about 4,200. Uh, at the stakes that I play, that's pretty good. But uh, uh, yeah, it depends upon uh, which stakes you play. That's not a very big score for someone who plays like a 25 50 game. Uh, but yeah. my game is usually two five or five ten, so. And and describe what those numbers mean. What does it mean two five? Oh yeah, five, yeah. That's uh, it's the blind levels. So that basically dictates how big the game you're gonna play is. Uh, you will sometimes see like a one three game. That's probably the most common, and that is going to be a, usually a buy in of about three to four hundred dollars. The two to f- two five games, the buy in is usually between. Uh, 500 to 1500 or so and then 510 is more like th- you know a thousand to three thousand buy-in so um and that you know that can change depending upon the the card room you're playing in but that's you generally the the stakes that you're playing at it's a little okay. bit difficult to explain what blinds are you'd have to go through yeah uh, the whole the whole uh theory of what poker is doing what you're doing when you're playing poker but yeah. uh Basically, you know, you've got a bunch of people at a table playing against each other, and uh, you know, the there are certain seats where um, the people, if they want to play the hand, have to put in a certain amount, or they have to put in a certain amount, and in order to continue playing, um, other people have to put in the big blind or at least that, right? So, and that sir, that goes around the table as you're playing more and more hands. Yeah, if you don't if you don't have blinds, there is no reason to play the game. It's called a dead game, meaning that there's no reason for a pot to build at all if there's nothing to incentivize putting money into a pot. So the blinds ensure that there is an incentive for people to put money into the pot. And that yeah. the blinds are changed from seat to seat every hand. So uh, your your position and and whether or not you're the blind is going to depend upon which hand you're you're playing. Uh depend yeah you know, the order uh, of the hands. Yeah. Just just another point about strategy, and we were talking about position. Um, talk a little bit about how your position on the table, you know, uh, in relation to the blinds d- changes the way that you might play a hand. 
Position is something that is probably one of the most important things to learn as a as a young poker player because when you receive a hand, uh, a hand has a particular, I would say, intrinsic value to it. And that value changes dramatically depending upon what position you are in relation to the blinds. Basically, the more likely you are to act last in the hand, to make the decision last, that means you're going to have more information than your opponent. And it makes a humongous difference about what, how much money you expect to make uh, with a certain kind class of hand. Uh, so if you're playing a, a hand out of position, you have to make the decision first whether to bet or check. And that might seem like a small deal to someone who doesn't play. But when you're playing, you realize the power of position. It, you are at a severe disadvantage if you are in, in an early position. So you want to play uh, stronger hands from an earlier position. Uh, so and then you can play a wider range of hands from an, from a later position and that position is going to be changing every single hand so one hand you're going to be in the in in an early position and then next in a few hands later you're going to be in a late position so the dynamic of the game is always changing well as our viewers can already tell um the game of poker specifically texas hold'em uh, there's a lot to it and a lot that you're thinking about constantly as you're playing I have a list of questions you've already answered in my next question. I was going to ask if you ever found yourself in financial trouble because of poker. Mm. But from what it sounds like, you're still running on that original $40 that you put in for the tournament. Um, and it, it, it sounds like you've never really hit any financial issues because of playing cash games. No, I think one of the qualities that makes... I would say there's many qualities that can make a good poker player, but to last a long time playing poker, it really does take someone who has, who is, who can be frugal and is not going to make foolish plays. Because if you look at the stories of even the best players in the world, they got so overconfident at, at times where they were playing stakes that they couldn't really bear to lose even if they were the best player in the pool which they often weren't when you, when you jump up in stakes if you can't afford to lose that amount of money you shouldn't play it because even if you're even if you're way better than the other players i get crushed by horrible players all the time it's because you can't you can't control the the short term results of the game i i i always tell people that Poker in the short term is an extremely unfair game. In the long term, it's an extremely fair game. So when you're in the in the moment, it feels like like ex, like either you're winning way too much than like you don't even deserve it, or you're getting crushed and you don't deserve it. And that's because that's the nature of variance. And if I so for example, if I have pocket queens and my opponent has ace king, and we we go all in. Uh, and we get to see all five cards, and there's no more action to happen in the hand. I'm a 50, we're, it's about a coin flip. We're 50 50. And whoever wins that is over realizing their equity, no matter what happens. So if you have pocket queens and you win against ace king, you are, you are winning. It's, it's a binary thing. You either win or you lose, but your equity is about 50 50. So over a long period of time, you're going to basically end up just it's going to be a draw over a long period of time if you if you have a sufficient sample size so that's the thing when it when variance goes against you even if you're a very good player and you can't afford to lose it you can land yourself in hot water and so i think one of my strengths has been uh playing within my means and mm. some people are better at that than others well, before we get too far into the weeds, uh, I do want to talk about poker and its relationship with Chris or like relation to Christianity, uh, mm -hmm. because there are, you know, just looking up the topic, you can find hundreds of articles on gambling, on poker, on how Christians should um, steward their money. And so I, I wanted to take a look at this because, you know, I grew up in in the South, I grew up in Arkansas, the Bible Belt, and any hint of gambling of any kind 
was just completely forbidden. Like uh, any hint of that, and you were completely uh, railed for it. So um, a lot of Christians take gambling for money to be a sin. And so obviously you don't. So have have you personally ever been confronted by fellow Christians for playing poker or um, has this just never been an issue in your life? It's never been an issue. You know, my parents are as conservative Christians you can get. And when I told them that I was starting to play poker, they were like, really cool. That's cool. I mean, I have never heard anybody really get upset about it. <laughs> but I I think there is a lot of stigma around gambling for good reason. And that's partly because when you think about gambling, most people think about going to the casino and playing a slot machine. And then the reality is when you go to a casino, those games are rigged in favor of the casino. In fact, they it's not even a secret. I mean, they basically say, we're going to make these games that are set up to allow us to win money. And we're going to let you play them. And people say, okay. And in yeah. reality, when I step into the, the casino and I see people at, at the slot machines, frankly, my I, I just sort of see them as a bunch of degenerates. And I, I can understand why it, there's a lot of stigma behind it. Um, and a lot of people are just frankly really addicted to gambling. And so I do think it is a... I do think it is a, it can be a pitfall for a lot of people. And I never, ever, ever, ever play slot machines. I never play any other any other game. I don't play any game that I can't win. But you know, I actually did think about this with what is the definition of gambling? And in a sense, the real dictionary definition of it is you is you take a risk and there's a there's a risk reward ratio. And it's usually for money, but you know, we do that all the time. You know, when you, yeah. when you when you open a business, you are risking your money. You're risking your time. You're risking a lot of things for money. So I think the, the big difference there, though, where it kind of maybe throws off the equation a little bit is poker is a zero sum, sum game. So in order for you to win, somebody has to lose. That's not true in necessarily in business. You can win and someone else can win, too. Uh, you know, when if you make a service, a product or a service, and people benefit from that, and you make a profit off of that, well, you both benefit. The uh, the difference with with gambling is someone has has to win and someone has to lose. So I can definitely understand why there's a stigma behind it, but you know, and the reality is, when I go to the poker table, uh, the people that I play with, they they know what they're doing. They know, and a lot of them are doing it for the enjoyment of the competition. There are a lot of guys that I play with who are retired and this is fun for them. Even though they probably know they're not winning players, they probably know it's more of an expense for them that they're paying to have the camaraderie of hanging out with a bunch of guys and, and dealing with a competition and challenging themselves. And um, I don't know. I just, I, it's never really concerned me. Maybe it should, but it just hasn't concerned me very much. So Yeah, well, you know, in preparation for this interview, I looked up a bunch of articles um, because I wanted to know what the arguments were. It's not something that I had ever really looked into deeply. Yeah. And so I wanted to know, is there strong basis, especially in Christianity, for saying that, you know, poker, playing for cash, is something that Christians shouldn't do? And you know, being raised, there's like this sort of, in, it was ingrained in me that just any gambling for money was sinful. And right. so the, but the more I looked into this, the more articles I read and things I read, um, it seemed like the arguments were really weak. And mm -hmm. like you were saying, you know, by definition, so many of our regular activities constitute gambling, um, mm -hmm. even for, for money. And so uh, a lot of the arguments just don't work. There are some arguments that are more difficult than others, and we'll, we'll touch on those. Um, mm -hmm. But I just thought it was interesting that, um, you know, the way that I was raised made it seem a lot more cut and dry than it really mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah. So let me, you know, one of the, uh, I'll bring up one of the, uh, the articles here. Um, there's a well-known Christian apologetic site call, called uh, gotquestions.org. 
And it's a, it's a really good apologetic site. I've actually had interaction with uh, the editors there. But uh, on there, there's an article called, Is It a Sin to Play Poker? And mm. the article goes through and cites a few verses related to the issue. And, and so let's just kind of go through some of these and take a look at you know, what they actually say uh, about uh, gambling and how we can apply it to poker. So first, they note verses on the love of money, right? Warnings against the love of money. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And then uh, another verse on the love of money, Hebrews thir uh, chapter 13, verse 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, mm -hmm. David, let me just straight up ask you, you know, <laughs> do you have a an unhealthy love for money? And is that why you play poker? I don't I mean, I want to say no, <laughs> but I think everybody kind of loves money in a sense because you're trying to get it right. I mean, people like, you know, I had a pastor that made a good point one time and he and he said, I think that this verse is a little it's kind of taken out of context a lot. He said, um, you know, it actually doesn't say the love of money is evil. It says it's the root of all evil. That actually is not the same thing. You know, I'm not going to say that loving money is a good thing, but it definitely can be, it definitely can lead to a lot of evil. But I don't think pursuing money is necessarily loving money in the first place. So, I mean, frankly, I think you might agree with me here. I kind of think that's a pretty weak argument because <laughs> you could try to get money. I mean, I can, I can invest in the stock market or something. Uh, does that mean I love money? I don't think so. You know, I, right. I think that means I'm just trying to get it, you know? Yeah. I don't think, I don't know too many Christian business owners who wake up saying, I hope I don't make any money today. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, everybody you're, you're, needs money. Everybody. Yeah. Your, your goal is to make money. If you're in business, uh, Paul, the apostle Paul made tents, right. To support his ministry. He wanted to make money selling tents. Um, yeah. I'm kind of surprised that they, I'm kind of surprised they cite that verse, uh, honestly. Uh, you know, I think that's one of those things where some people just don't like the idea of gambling. And like I said, it's for good reason. And it may not be prudent for someone to, to even come close to a casino. And I know some people like that. They shouldn't ever step foot in, in, into a casino. Uh, but, yeah, I'm kind of surprised that they would kind of, I don't know, try to do a Hail Mary like that. Well, it says something about love and money. I don't know if I agree with that. So. <laughs> well, certainly I think, you know, uh, there are some people in poker who that is their goal. They they want to get a lot of money very quickly. And you can do that uh, at the expense of others um, who mm -hmm. don't know what they're doing. And so, I mean, I can see an application for that, but it's not intrinsic to poker, right? Mm -hmm. You don't it's not a necessary entailment that if you play poker, you have an unhealthy love for money, right? Yeah. Just, be, just like pretty much any other activity, um, you know, there are healthy ways to do them. By the way, I play with some guys. I mean, there's just a lot of different kinds of personality you play with. I play with some guys who are strong believers too. And I've, you know, we get in conversations. I was in, I was at a game one time and, you know, we're, it wasn't small stakes either. We're, you know, we're trading around thousands of dollars and there's this one guy and he just started, I mean, we, it was this kind of younger guy and he was kind of secular and he was just like going, like preaching the word to him. He's like, you need to confess your sins to Jesus Christ. Get rid of, you know, he was just like, while we're, while we're throwing the money around, you know, and it's kind of, it was, it was actually kind of beautiful. Like I really liked what, what, you know, what he was saying. And so, you know, we we talk about this stuff. I talk about God to to my fellow poker players. I talk about philosophy. I talk about I've talked about Molinism with 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 players. In fact, I, I play with one guy who's who's a uh, he's he's an atheist now. He's a former Christian, and he is a really well educated about about apologetics and about even about Molinism. He knows a lot about that stuff, and we've talked a lot about that at the poker table. But anyway, yeah, continue on. Well, that, that brings up another point. I actually wasn't going to bring this up, but I, I saw an article that was talking about uh, poker as a mission field because mm -hmm. there are so many people that 
they play so much poker that you won't reach them any other way. They're not in conversation with you outside of the poker table, but mm -hmm. being able to sit at that table and have conversation and build rapport is a, a way to reach them. Uh, and mm -hmm. like you said, you're having conversation about this stuff around the poker table as you're playing. Um, yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. And uh, there was another article saying that there's actually a lot more um, professional poker players on televised events who are now outspoken uh, about their Christianity. So, Oh, interesting. I, I haven't yeah. seen any for a while, uh, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. I would like to know who those, who those people are because most of the people yeah. I play with, are not like the, you know, guys who play like live on TV and stuff. I play with a couple that have been on, on big streams and stuff, but uh, for the most part, uh, I play with just like ordinary people, you know, people that live right by me, you know? So uh, people like uh, that I know, I know people that they know, and it's, you know, it's kind of a small community in, in, in a sense. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, um, they, they keep going. So they warn against the love of money. They also bring up verses uh, against get rich quick activities. Mm -hmm. So, for example, they cite Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11, which says wealth gained hastily will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And then uh, also Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This, is also, this also is vanity. Um, that Ecclesiastes what, 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 verse kind of sounds more like love of money. Yeah, but, yeah I was going yeah. to say, can you read that one again? Uh, but it, I'm sorry, was, was this from God, God Questions too? Yeah, yeah, this is all from the same article weak sauce come on <laughs> god questions you got to do better than that oh my goodness what was the first one again the first one proverbs 13 11 wealth gained hastily will yeah. dwindle but whoever gathers little by little will increase it yeah i mean i i would wonder if somebody if the person who wrote that article they might be an amazing person so nothing against them but if someone said all right i want you to invest in this oh I'll do a raffle and it costs you a dollar and you have a 50 50 chance of winning a million dollars. Would they, would they do it? I'm pretty sure they would, uh, you know, and that's a get rich quick scheme, I guess. But I mean, in reality is poker is not necessarily people, you know, trading their, their, you know, putting their mortgage mortgages on their house to win millions of dollars. It's, you know, some people are playing for small stakes and some people are, playing medium stakes and uh you know a lot of the guys playing for the big big stakes they've got a lot of money i play with some guys who are very wealthy and losing a few grand to them is not a big deal so it is not i mean i my life is I, I, you know i make money play, playing poker but uh nowhere in the cards for me uh was i ever thinking oh i want to get rich quick uh, that's yeah. not that's not my thing um and it's it really when you look at the variance, it's really not sustainable um, mm -mm. as a get rich quick, right? Because you're no. playing with statistics that are against that sort of get rich quick yeah. idea. Um, well, I, yeah, I have, when you track your, your stats in poker, uh, which you should do if you want to play at least seriously, over a sufficient number of hands or a sufficient number of hours, you will get a pretty somewhat reliable hourly rate. And that rate is pretty modest. I mean, when you look at it in the context of a lot of hours, pretty soon those thousand, those thousand dollar swings, two, three, four thousand dollar swings turn into a much smaller number that's either positive or negative. You want you want to be positive because that means you're a profitable poker player. That number isn't some giant ginormous number I, I i wish it was but it's pretty modest when you actually look at people who play poker uh, yeah. Um, seriously yeah and good poker players know how to mitigate those losses right and mm -hmm. continue to be in the positive even if those gains aren't huge right over the long run they're willing to sit there for a long time playing good solid methodical poker in order to mm -hmm. see those results keep going up right mm -hmm. so it's it's uh I, you know the the pro verse in proverbs says whoever gathers little by little will increase it so mm -hmm. you know that second yeah. part can apply very easily to poker as well 
Yeah. You know, I remember my one of the first times I ever played No Limit Hold'em, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought I remember people like saying all in and I wanted to do that. And one time I just said, what if I just went all in here? What would they do? It was like it was now I look back on it. It was a ridiculously stupid play. And I got called by a guy with a, you know, a slight. I he had I had nothing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? I felt like a total idiot. And I lost like 250 bucks. And I felt like my life was over because I feel like a total failure. As I got into playing poker more, you know, if I lose a couple grand, I go home and it it doesn't it barely even hurts because I know over it over time, my hourly rate is what matters. Over a sufficient number of hands is really where, really what what I'm expecting. I'm not expecting to win twenty thousand. You know, if I lose a few grand, it it sucks. I mean, it feels because I'm competitive. I hate to lose. Uh, but I'm not going to – it's not going to like drastically change my life because I'm managing my bankroll uh, in yeah. a responsible way. Okay. Let's keep going. So in that same article, um, you know, so the one verse really that's applicable to get rich quick activities, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really rule out poker because um, both parts of that can apply depending on your actual strategy or your, your approach to poker. Um, the next set of verses – uh, they say that there are more benef beneficial uses of money than gambling. So this should be a motivator to use your money on activities other than poker or other uh, mm -hmm. methods of gambling. So, for example, they have Luke chapter 6, verse 38, which says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured uh, for the measure, measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm really not sure how that applies, you know, to be honest. Uh, you can... You can win a lot of poker. You know, it's actually interesting. There's this one guy uh, named Bill. Um, gosh, I forgot his last name, but he's like a billionaire and he plays in like really big games and he gives away everything that he makes. And he's actually a really good poker player. Uh, you know, it doesn't. The point is you can make money playing poker and then you can be really selfish with it or you can make money playing poker and raise your family with it. You know, I mean, uh or give it to a friend or, you know, it, 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 like I said, you know, we're like, we were talking about before, it doesn't really make it, I don't really see the relevance to, to, to poker, but I yeah. do understand why in, in general, being responsible with money is an important thing to do. I mean, if you, if you are wasting your money, you know, that's, that's foolish. Uh, I, I don't think it is prudent for a lot of people, like I said, to be spending time in casinos. Uh, I, if someone told me if they want to play poker, but they don't want to study, I would say that is foolish. You shouldn't do it. You should, if you want to go play poker, you should learn how to play. You should actually get to being a profitable player. So, yeah. Yeah, I would apply the same to somebody who's going into business for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're going into business for yourself, you're assuming a lot of risk. You're putting your finances forward in order to hopefully make a profit. But there are some people who are just bad at business. And they haven't learned any of the fundamentals. They're they're spending their money in you know not wise ways. Those people should not be running a business and should probably just work for somebody at a company or uh, you know someplace else um, who knows what they're doing so that they can actually gain an income. So those people also would you know have more beneficial uses of their money than sinking it into a business that's not being run well so exactly yeah like like i said i think the probably the the strongest argument you could make is that poker like i said it's a zero sum game that's the i think that's the really the tricky part of it is um and if you open a business you could potentially set up a situation where your clients get served their lives be get better your life gets better because you profit and that's the beauty of you know beauty of capitalism i guess not to get into that issue but um in gambling it's not exactly the same there's not really the the profit i guess you could say the win win cuz so people people lose at the poker table right um but 
they really enjoy playing and they get a lot of enjoyment out of the whole situation. So I, I kind of think of it as they're paying the cost um, uh, to have the enjoyment to play. And so, you know, uh, I don't see a problem with that, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was going to bring this up in a different context, but I think it's appropriate here. Um, really, I think the exact same parallel argument can be made against sports, right? In professional sports, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but you're you're spending an enormous amount of money and resources and time on developing yourself and your skills in order to enter competitions, tournaments, in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. And many of those are also zero sum, right? If one person wins, other people are losing, right? Because yeah. the competition, that's the nature of competition. Um, and a lot of people go in with the expectation of winning money, right? There's prize money as incentive to do well in the tournament. And um, it seems exactly parallel to poker where you're paying an entry fee for tournaments, say, and there's a hope uh, that you will enter into the cash, right? The the number of people um, who, if they're remaining, will receive more cash on top of their um, their app, uh, entry fee. Um, that's a hope. But you know, a lot of people understand as they're entering the tournament, they they understand that if they don't enter the cash, then they've just lost that money, and that's just well, the risk you take. Well, I think. Um... If you really think it like you mentioned like you had like a little church uh poker game that you played where you yeah. it was like 20 bucks or whatever. Um it's interesting that nobody seems to find a problem with that. I mean, I, I used to have a I had a I remember I there was a youth pastor at church uh that I that I went to. Actually, I still go to. And he was like, "Hey, come on over. We're going to do a little $20 tournament." There was no stigma behind it at all, right? So, you think about it, what's the difference between that and a $10,000 entry fee, right? Well, it's not a principle. It's the amount. So there's an amount that you could be prudent. It would be not prudent for you to to spend and an amount that seems to, to be fine. So there's not really a principled reason here. It seems to be like, what's how do you do it in a in moderation? How do you do it responsibly? So I think that's true with, with anything. I mean, um, you know, alcohol is kind of like that. I mean, alcohol is really enjoyable for a lot of people and it, it's also one of the greatest evils in some people's life uh you have to be prudent with all the decisions you make it, every single one of them you can abuse them and it can ruin your life or you can actually be a great benefit to your life yeah great point all right so uh the last thing that's brought up in that got questions article that i think is probably the one of the stronger points is that we should avoid activities that cause others to stumble. Mm -hmm. And for this, they cite 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 to 33. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. So mm -hmm. everybody knows that some people have a problem with gambling, a problem with uh, being addicted to gambling. And so enabling or, or um, facilitating those um, sinful temptations and behaviors would not be beneficial, right? Uh, we don't want to cause other people to stumble. So how, how would you approach that? If you knew that gambling was a problem for somebody and you're sitting down at the table um, and that came up. How would you handle that? That's a tricky question because there's only so much you know about people's lives. I, I don't want to be like a – I don't want to like dismiss this this point because – but I – like let's say you throw a barbecue and someone comes over and you're like, well, they have a problem with gluttony. I don't know. How, that's that's difficult to know uh, what, what to do. I, I guess – it's it would be interesting to me whether or not the stumble in that context is talking about stumbling into sin or stumbling into maybe foolishness. Uh, you know, someone could be foolish at the poker table. I don't necessarily think it's sinful. Hmm. Um, you know, where that line is drawn between foolish and sinful is a little bit tricky. 
Um, you know, to be honest with you, if I had a friend that I was playing poker with and he was like falling into addiction, even if I was winning money off of him, I would tell him to stop. You know, I have a friend that I play with. Uh, we, we became friends at the poker table and we're both winning players and we text each other hands and stuff. And I'm trying to think if, you know, if he went down a spiral, <laughs> I would tell him, dude, you need to stop. You need to stop playing. But, you know, that like I said, that that line between wise, yeah, yeah, wise liberty and yeah is a little bit difficult it's a it's a point that's well taken but like i said like it's it people tend to interpret verses like this where it's convenient for them if they've got like this bias against poker then they are probably going to say well that applies to poker and then some people are like oh well you know that applies to drinking too that's why you should never drink and yeah. you know uh, there's some controversy behind that i, well, I, I was going to bring that up uh yeah. you know having been in the military still being part of the military community uh, alcohol is a huge problem, right? Uh, it's an alcoholic culture. And so if you're someone who chooses not to drink at any of the events, you really stand out. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in the military, I drank, but, you know, uh, after a while, you know, really focusing on my relationship with the Lord, I, I realized what that was doing to my witness in that context. And mm -hmm. I just stopped drinking around military people for a while. And, mm -hmm. um, they, they really noticed, like there were people that would come up to me and be like, I don't even recognize you anymore. And that, that says a lot about being a light, you know, in where you are standing out, uh, separating yourself and the way that God has um, affected you. So, you know, I could see that with poker too. There are instances where it might be a, a good thing to refrain um, because of the context, but in other situations, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's it's that balance between legalism and and freedom. It's always been a contentious issue in Christianity. I mean, this is like this goes back to the very beginning and where to draw that line is pretty tricky. Uh, you know, uh, there's things that you should obviously not do. I just I don't know, when I'm at the poker table, like it just doesn't get the feeling of the 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 sinister nature that some people think uh, about gambling in all contexts i mean i see a bunch of guys having fun and enjoying themselves and yeah some of them lose and they pay a cost for that and that's up to them and i can't go around and check all their bank accounts and make sure they're all doing fine um you know you could have a business for instance where you sell a product that you know i don't know what it is but someone could just be habitually buying that product like just way too much you know let's say you you sell uh you know, candy or something. I don't know. And someone's just like coming in every day. I don't know. What's your responsibility to that person? I, I guess a better example could be could be raised, but I don't know. That, that's tricky. I just saw I just saw a video recently of a lady who she bought moisturizer, this particular moisturizer, like obsessively, and used it so much that her cells actually stopped um, producing moisture on their own because they were getting all this moisture from the moisturizer. And so um, in order to get her healthy again, because obviously it's not healthy for your skin not to produce its own moisture, um, you know, they had to wean her off of it and her, her, all of her skin was just peeling and cracked and trying, you know, they had to put her through this very painful process. So all that to say, you could be selling a product like moisturizer and enabling someone to destroy their body um, because you're yeah. not regulating what they do, right? and that's and it's very and, difficult. And that's a trivial example too. I mean, you could you could say this with almost anything. I mean, I, I like yeah. to go to Padre games a lot. Now, they're not doing so amazing right now, but I guess I could habitually <laughs> be going to every Padre game, and I could empty my bank account. You know, I mean that. What's their responsibility to me? I don't know. I don't think they have any. I think that's my responsibility, or that's the responsibility of people who care about me. You know, they're like, hey, you're spending too much money on this. So, yeah. So, it, yeah, it seems like we're agreed that it has a lot to do with what you know about people, right? If you mm. see them struggling, um, being pulled towards temptation, you you kind of have an obligation as a Christian to not enable that. Um, that if you can do something to help them avoid that, you should. So. Yeah. Very good. All this isn't to say 
hey guys, everybody should go out and <laughs> buy in for a thousand dollars at the poker table. I don't think you should do that. I think you should probably, you know, still be wise with your money. I think it's a responsibility, uh, not just as a Christian, but just you know, if you're a, a if you're a husband or a father or a mother or whatever, like you're you have a responsibility to the people around you to to be wise with what you the decisions you make. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, one really bad article I read uh, was from Focus on the Family, which generally, I mean, you know, they've been around a long time. They've produced some great stuff, but this was pretty bad. But, um, you know, they uh, they raise an issue uh, regarding poker about spiritual health. And this is a quote from that article. It says, all of the relevant evidence leads us to believe that gambling is often an addictive and compulsive form of behavior. Not only that, but it is frequently destructive to individuals and families alike. What's more, the addictive and compulsive qualities of gambling are progressive in nature. They start small and grow over the course of time. In some cases, they eventually become all consuming. And then they say, they, they turn to advice. They say, our best advice then is to steer clear of gambling in any form as we see it, it's all too easy to nickel and dime your way into a hole. That hole can become so deep that you'll regret you ever got into it. This is something you want to avoid, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. End quote. Yeah, this this goes back to the ambiguous nature of the word gambling. I, there may be a more formalized definition, but as far as I've ever seen, it's just like putting up a risk for the benefit of possibly winning money. And that's true of many things in life i think like we like i was saying before the casino context is very foolish and there's a lot i would say there's a lot of spiritual evil at casinos because people are attached to this this i don't have no idea why but they're attached to this game that is rigged to make you lose so i i can get why there's a negative connotation behind it but like you were saying gambling in any form well, well that's clearly not true i mean if you walk outside you're you're gambling and that's not a trivial difference i think people maybe we'll talk about this in a little bit when you realize when you start learning poker theory there's so much about the game itself that just is so relevant to life too like there is a there's an element of risk reward there is an element of of, hey, I'm going to put this amount of money as a risk in the hopes of winning this amount. And that's not just money. That could be decisions that you make. If you decide to go into a certain career, that could be the worst decision you ever make. Uh, I don't see how that's principally different. Uh, so mm -hmm. maybe someone could show me how it is, but. Well, I'll tell you, living here in Las Vegas, walking outside is definitely a gamble. <laughs> yeah, my uh, goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great point. All right. Um, the next thing they say in that focus on the family article is, uh, they suggest that poker is contrary to the biblical command to love your neighbor as yourself. So here's the quote it says, quote, there are a number of fundamental scriptural principles that come into play here. And we suggest that the first and foremost is the emphasis Jesus places on love, quote, love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, 31. The truth is that gambling isn't as innocuous as one might suppose. It's actually predicated on the losses, pain, and suffering of others. For one to win at gambling, others must lose. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of already addressed this, that mm -hmm. um, first of all, people who enter these cash games, yes, some of them will lose. Um, mm -hmm. But Most they understand do. that risk. Yeah, they understand that risk. And it's not necessarily painful or suffering for them in the sense that I think the article is suggesting, right? They go into it mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons um, in the hopes to win and in, in the hopes of getting better um, mm -hmm. in enjoying the company of other players, entertainment. So, yeah, there are a lot of reasons why somebody might come out losing and just not really feel bad about it. Um, Talk like you were mentioning sports, I, it, I don't think it could be uh, overemphasized enough. People who are in, in any competition, when they lose, especially if it's their profession, there's a lot of pain and suffering there. I mean, it's – yeah, they might make a lot of money doing that, but they 
it hurts. It hurt. Talk to any professional. Now, the reality is, I got, like I said, I have some friends at the poker table. We want to cause lots of pain and suffering to each other. That's part of the fun of it. When I beat <laughs> a friend of mine and I take him for a 4K pot, you better believe that I love his pain and suffering. But guess <laughs> what? <talking> trash. <laughs> yeah, but guess what? It, he's the same. It's the same with me. When he beats me, he loves it. And then when we get out the poker table, we're friends. I don't see why you can't also love the people that it's it's a competition look i mean yes it matters because there's money involved but that doesn't mean you can't love someone i don't know you know i'll say this all the people that i've ever won money off of i promise you i love them very much and i wish them well you know uh, i don't i don't wish pain and suffering on them but you know i don't know this kind of sounds like a little bit like uh like wokeness a little bit <laughs> a little bit like it's okay. You live in you're, California. You're, yeah, you <laughs> cause me the uh, pain and suffering. I mean, you can cause someone to be in pain and suffering for a lot of reasons. Like I was saying, yes, I understand that some people can ruin their lives with this stuff. I do understand that. And that's true of probably more things in life than just gambling. Yeah, I think the parallels between poker especially and sports, professionals, other professional sports, whatever it is, basketball, baseball, football, whatever, are very – much closer than most people realize and yeah. so if you have a problem with poker cash poker then you should probably have a problem with all professional sports that involve the same principles um and i don't think a lot of people are willing to take it there mm -hmm. uh all right so final thing on that focus on the family article it says they claim uh, that gambling shows a lack of trust in God. So here's the quote. It says, gambling undermines a believer's trust in God. The Bible teaches that Christians are to look to him as their sole provider and to be content with the material blessings they receive from his hand. Involvement in gambling indicates both lack of trust and dissatisfaction with the Lord's provision. Those are pretty strong words there. They're so strong and they're very... Yeah. Yeah. Do you lack trust in God and uh, uh, are you discontent with the provision that he's given to you? They're strong words and they're very puzzling because I don't know what that means. I, I honestly <laughs> don't. How does how does it? I don't know how that works. Yeah, they said it undermines a believer's trust in God. So I yeah. guess I guess what they're trying to imply is that if you're sitting at a poker table and you're gambling, you're 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 um, relying, and I don't even know, they, they may have a broader definition of gambling that includes something like, you know, uh, the slots or blackjack or something like that. Um, maybe they think that sitting down to those games, you're inherently relying on luck. And mm -hmm. so you want to get lucky. You want to um, get money from those games that is not provided by God. It's provided by luck. Maybe that's what they're thinking. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that is kind of true in some contexts. Uh, some people do, you know, they are just kind of, they're doing a Hail Mary. They're wishing for that slot to just give them that million dollars. I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call that like evil. Uh, like it just, like I said, it could be foolish. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, like I was saying with, with poker in the end, all, all of that stuff about the, the, how random the cards are, that stuff is really a distraction because in the short terms it, it seems like you are just blindly hoping for chance to go your way but over time if you're a better player you're going to win more money it's just the it's just the way it is uh over a sufficient sample size you're going to win more money the short term it feels like there is another force at play in fact we call it at the poker table we call it uh we have a name for it it's called the poker gods we will say the poker gods and everybody uses this language uh, because when you witness the the crazy nature of randomness, it's way crazier than people think it is. Uh, it feels almost personal. It almost feels like there is someone conspiring against you because things will happen that you'll think is just not possible. How could that possibly happen? And also it can happen in a positive way too where you just feel like I can't lose. In the short term, it feels like that. In the long term, 
math takes over. Math doesn't care. It, it just, it's really interesting how that happens, how, you know, it feels like you're appealing to some sort of, I don't know, abstract force out there in the universe. And all of a sudden it just turns out to be math. Uh, yeah, this quote is really puzzling. I mean, it's a game that has certain rules that has, you know, um, certain statistics behind it that are very predictable. Um, even though, and like you said, in the short term, um, you might see some crazy stuff happen, but I, I don't see anything about it that implies or entails that one cannot, that it undermines a believer's trust in God. Mm -hmm. um, that just seems like a, a really huge stretch. And like you said, if you're a good poker player and you're, you know, you know what you're doing and your overall net is positive, then, you know, why can't you see that as God providing you the talent that you need in order to net positive from this? And therefore you, you attribute to God this game, right? Mm -hmm. I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like this is kind of always, it, this is a kind of notoriously gray territory. And, you know, I, I tend to find with gray territories that people have that have a natural bias against something. Maybe they have someone in their family who like, this happens a lot with, with alcohol too. Like people who have alcoholics in their family will like tend to want to look at all the verses that are negative about alcohol and the people that have like a lot of, maybe they have really great times with their family. They'll tend to want to look at the positive verses for alcohol and then they like have a bias in that way i think that tends to be the case with just about any uh subject in, in uh, scripture where it's like not like clearly like laid out this is sinful or evil um you know it's it's a tricky thing because there's not like a clear answer uh it's not like we have someone that just like gives us the answers uh you know we have scripture but scripture is ambiguous in certain areas and yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely all right. So just on a personal level, though, um, you know, we dealt with a lot of these verses. And so far, the ar the biblical arguments, at least, seem very weak against mm -hmm. playing poker for cash. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, that doesn't mean people should go out and play cash games if they don't, mm -hmm. especially if they don't know what they're doing. Um, but it does suggest that maybe the position that some people take against poker because it's gambling um, mm -hmm. is not as biblically supported uh, as a lot of people think. So just on a personal level, how do you make sure that poker doesn't adversely affect your relationship with God? I guess it's not really ever come up. Uh, I mean, I just don't see the connection. You know, like I never felt like it was like a, like a temptation for me or something. I, I, so... I just really haven't really thought about it. You know, uh, it's just something that I do and I have fun doing. And um, I don't know. Uh, I guess I don't have an answer to that. I, it It's never been an issue for me. I guess that's a short answer. Uh, so you so, just have kind of the the constitution, the disposition um, that it you're just responsible with it. You're patient. You're able to do it well. Um, so mm -hmm. it's never really threatened your relationship with god yeah no not at all i i i think it's a beautiful game uh it's and in in a sense it it's a good insight too about how and we might get into this too like how sovereign god is because god if god is sovereign over the world he is sovereign over this whole crazy game with all the probabilities all over the place and if anything I've actually like gone home at times thinking to myself, wow, all this stuff is somehow in God's control. That's crazy. When you actually look at how bizarre uh, probabilities are and randomness is, the randomness of the world, it's so much more than people think. When you actually learn poker, you will realize how random things are. And if you realize God is sovereign over that, it is woo. It is way bigger than you think. Uh, it's every situation yeah. you're in has an intrinsic probability. And like I said, if you have if you have Ace King versus Queens, and you get over and you get the money in over a bil a billion times, it's going to about even out. Uh, Queens has a little bit of an advantage, like a couple percent. But uh, it's interesting that God doesn't seem to be tinkering with that. He's just sovereign over it, and. 
we don't know how that works. Uh, you know, Molina provided some insights on that, uh, but uh, you know, he's sovereign over the whole thing. And this is happening in your life, whether you want to play poker or not. There are certain intrinsic probabilities that you can't control, where there's a percentage chance that something might happen, something might not, and yeah. um, and God is sovereign over it. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about Molina, so I don't know if you want to say a few more words about, you know, you you know, playing poker has made you think more about God's sovereignty and his omniscience and how he has control over everything. So did yeah. you want to elaborate on that at all? Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting because I – one time before I went to play, I was like in my car and I was praying and I thought to myself, what am I praying for? Uh, before a game, am I praying that God makes things go my way? That can't be right because what that would mean is that God is literally tinkering with probability. He is he is making it so heads comes up more times than tails, which over the long term, it can't happen. If that happened, then all of poker theory would go out the window. It wouldn't be reliable. If God is literally just like, I'm going to favor this person here and favor this person here, and the results don't come out according to what the intrinsic equities are to the situation, then poker strategy wouldn't be reliable, and we know what it is. And that applies to so many other aspects in life. And God is in control of that. He is in control in such a way where he doesn't tinker with probabilities. And this is one of the issues that, you know, I probably would have to do a lot more thinking about it, but I was just thinking about like maybe like the Calvinist model of, of sovereignty. It is kind of odd to me that God would pre-plan a world and say, you know, I'm going to cause it to be that a, a coin comes up 50% of the time. 50 /50. <laughs> yeah. Because there's no reason if God is causing everything, why wouldn't you know? Other than just His whims, why wouldn't why couldn't He just make it 100 percent time? It never comes up on tails. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems like He could do that. Seems like He could do that everywhere else. I mean, it's true on Molinism; He could do that as well. But I think what would happen is the you know I'm sure there's a there's a lot probably more written about this, but I suppose that with in in the Molinist model, the feasible worlds are going to have a natural probabilities built into them because God doesn't control. I don't know if he. Uh, I'd probably have to go back on this because uh, he. I think uh, Kirk McGregor talks about him being uh, Molina's view was that God was in control of stochastic processes as well. That means random processes, truly, even truly random processes, like uh, the, the decay of a particle or something. You know? mm -hmm. And it seems like the, the the feasible worlds would have an intrinsic probabilities built into them. Uh, I'd, I'd probably have to think about that a little bit more, but. I, it just seems, seems, kind of seems odd to me that God would make the world in such a way where he's just like, no, no, I can't do that because I got to make sure it adds up to 50-50, the coin. And we're not yeah. just talking about coins here. We're talking about countless situations that even if we are not aware of the intrinsic probabilities, they're there whether we know of them or not. You know, mm -hmm. there's an intrinsic probability that I go out right now and I get hit by a plane. You know, a plane falls from the sky. There is a probability to that. Uh, there's a probability that I'll get in a car accident. Yeah, I mean, and sure, you know, God can sovereignly order things in which I don't, but uh, that those probabilities exist in poker and in life. Uh, so I think that's uh, it's something that has gotten me to think about God's sovereignty a lot and seeing, yeah. like I was saying, it, it cannot be overemphasized how bizarre uh, randomness is. Uh, it doesn't follow any pattern that you think yet. The odds just kind of start to come out and regress to the mean. Over time, the you know your flush draw is going to hit twenty percent of the time, and that's just the way it is. Um, yeah, yeah. Something you said kind of uh, raised another point, was just, which was uh, when God says that you know in Him there's, or when the the Bible says that in God there is no partiality, right? Mm -hmm. um, he treats everyone um, with fairness. And I kind of think playing poker makes you realize that, right? If you have the same people playing the same hands the same way over, you know, a, a huge sample size, you're going to see the same results, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the statistics. 
Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people under the impression that God is actively favoring certain people in very weird ways, as Mm -hmm. far as like just mundane things like poker or, you know, business or Mm -hmm. job situation, love, whatever. When in reality, there are certain natural principles that God put into play to make things fair, right? On a a very real level. So I think that's one lesson you can kind of learn from poker is that uh, there are certain statistics, certain rules that the universe follows that were were created by God, um, but that he's not, you know, tinkering with in some weird way. Yeah. If you want to make bad plays in poker, I promise you God's going to let you lose. (laughs) <laughs> and if you make and if you make good plays, he's gonna let you win. That's built into the world. Uh, I mean, this is over a sufficient sample size, of course. Uh, but it, it actually kind of made me realize that I'm not special. You know, like I I know that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and He loves me. But God's not gonna say, "All right, now I'm gonna give you the good cards." I've realized that that just doesn't happen. It, now I think. I have to be honest. I, I do feel like, and I, I'm not like God didn't make me one of the best players in the world. If I played against some of the top tier players, they'd probably crush me over a, over a long period of time. But I don't know why. But God seen. I had a love of poker since I was a kid, and I saw that movie, and and God led me in the right direction somehow. Obviously, if He's sovereign, He did. Uh, he led me in the right direction to teach me the game. I learned how to play the game, and I had the personality. I consider it to be a gift from God. You know, um, you know, that's a little controversial, but I always felt like that. I always felt like, hey, God gave me this gift, and I didn't know it, but I could play poker. For a long time, I thought I couldn't do it, but then I started to learn how to do it, and I realized, hey, I'm a good player. This is a lot of fun for me. So, Yeah, well, you just gave God the glory for, you know, where you are and uh, what you're doing. So uh, I think that's the right attitude to take, um, mm-hmm. especially if you're doing well. So excellent. Um, Why we've been uh, chatting for a while and thank you so much for sharing, you know, your wisdom on this topic. Uh, I think we've covered some really good ground and hopefully open to people's eyes um, to the details surrounding, especially poker's relationship to Christianity. Mm. Um, but just to close things out, um, what advice would you give to anyone who is playing poker or considering playing poker at more than just a casual level? Well, I would say there are, we live in a time where there are free resources available that were never possible 20 years ago. I think that if I were to play a lot of the players from 20 years ago, I would kill them. And it's only because I have so much more information living in 2024 than they did back then. And the reality is that most of the players who lose, it's just because they refuse to put any work in. They refuse to study. So I would literally just go on YouTube and start looking up some of these free resources. Uh, there's a guy named Bart Hansen has a lot of great uh, – he has a call-in show where they go over hands. They talk about the uh, – you get a lot of logic from poker. This guy, Jonathan Little, who has a lot of free resources. You can literally just say – Jonathan Little poker and just start watching videos and then you do have to accept the fact that if you want to play at first you'll probably lose but if you play small stakes and you can manage those losses you might find out you're a good player it really takes someone who can think logically not make so many emotional decisions not let misfortune affect their logic and uh you know, it, it would take a while for me to explain everything that you need to do. But in order to do that, you really should say, I want to play, but I also want to, every time I play, study the game. What What is actually the goal of the game? What am I actually trying to do? When I bet, when I fold, when I check, what is the point of all that? There are reasons for all of those things. And it's abstract, and it takes a long time to learn, and you don't need to know it perfectly because most players are pretty horrible. And if you put in a modest amount of time, you will be able to beat a very significant portion of the player field out there. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you know you don't feel like you're one of the top players in the world, but I guess that that depends on your uh, your sample size, right? Because as you said, there are a lot of horrible players out there, and if you broaden your sample size wide enough, yeah then you are one of the top players in the world, right? That's true. Um, That's true. Yeah. So I, I think it's the same. You know, I played tennis since I was like 
10 years old. So mm-hmm. I don't consider myself one of the top players in the world. But when you take a big enough sample size, people who barely picked up a racket. Yeah, I'm I'm a really good tennis player. So well, let's consider yeah. this, Tyson. You and I probably know more about Molinism than 99.9% of the people, but more than that who have yeah. ever existed, including every Christian. We probably know every way more about Molinism than all of them. So, yeah, if you specialize in a topic, you're going to know more than they do. But, uh, yeah, poker is 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 a very profitable game for people who are willing to put in some work. And it's really fun and exciting and devastating and really exciting. And you have to realize that that's all part of the beauty of it. It's it, that's the that's the competitive nature is really the fun of, of the game. It's a beautiful game. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for spending your time uh, with us, David, and, and your insights. For you guys out there watching, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm interested to know what you think. Um, is it legitimate? Uh, is it a sin or is it not for Christians to play poker for cash? Please let us know in the comments. Until next time, see you later.